this was a very sex driven episode. This is where Dyson and Bo, Bo and Dyson were, you know, figuring out their boundaries of like yeah. what they could do. So, I mean, we're banging all the time. <laughs> so all like, the time. Four times, five times in this episode. So I remember when this one came, both you and I were both like, oh God, okay, how are we going to do this one now? My name is Anna Silk. For six seasons, I played Bo on the hit TV series, Lost Girl. I am so happy you are here for the Lost Girl Rewatch podcast to take a trip down memory lane with me, the amazing cast, and some very special guests. I'm so glad to finally be able to say the family is back together again. Welcome back, everybody, to the Lost Girl Rewatch podcast. I am so excited that you are here joining me today. We are talking about episode five today, and I have an embarrassment of riches over here because I am so lucky that I get. Mr. Chris Holden Reed as my co host, co host back to back weeks. So please help me welcome Chris Holden Reed. Thank you all for very, thank you all for having me again. Um, as you can see, Anna and I haven't changed our clothes. We just decided no. we'd uh, wear the same thing all week, all the way. Yes, yeah, so we've through. been sitting here for one week waiting for each just other. Waiting. That's right. Yeah. Um, it's a good thing we're not live, like together because whew, I've been yeah, sweating. No, it's this. a little ripe. Yeah. <laughs> it's a little ripe. Uh, welcome back. I'm happy to see you again. Um, we are here to talk about season one, episode five, which was called Dead Lucky. It was written by Emily Andras and directed by John Fawcett. Now, here's the thing about John Fawcett. John Fawcett directed our pilot episode, and he was the executive producer, or I think he was an EP on it, right? First season? Yeah. Was he EP as well? Right. I, I believe he so was. He yeah. was really, he was fundamental in creating Lost Girl. And is this the first episode that he directed after the pilot, or did he do? Because number one well, was that French guy. Yes. Yep. Eric Kenuel did one. Yeah. Uh, we had, well, remember we shot out of order. So I oh, do exactly. know that right. he so did our spider well. episode, the one where we all get bit by the spider and, um, Kenzie and I are losing our minds and, uh, he directed that one. I know that, but I do think you're right. The reason I can tell this was early on, Chris, in the, mm. in the filming schedule was because there's a stiffness in Bo in this episode, just, just a little tiny, little stiffness. I call it stiffness. It's really nerves that Anna was going through, yeah. but there's just a little bit less looseness in Bo. So we look like we had some energy, whereas yeah. <laughs> we season. look more awake. <laughs> exactly. But, um, but yeah, this episode, how did you feel watching this episode and what, what comes to mind when you were watching? You know it? what? Um, this one really, I remembered so much of it. So this is, I think you're right. It was very early on. Like, so this was John Fawcett. This may have been, it had to have been one of the first episodes back. I don't know. It must've been. Yeah. Cause you're well, right. When we went to series. Cause we, okay. Eight was our pilot. Year yeah, later. We, saw we go to series. Year before. Yeah. We go to series. We shot episode one. Right. With Eric. Then I believe we shot episode five. So this was the second thing we filmed. I think it was. Uh huh. That makes sense. Because yeah, the the as I was watching it, like in the morgue, like being there with that, that big guy, that wrestler oh, guy, yeah, and you're fighting guy. him, and I'm hitting the door. Like I remember it so viscerally. I know. Like, it was a lead plate, and I remember mashing my fist into it, and I was just I like. And like the, the wolfing out stuff, like we were still building how, you know, how these characters work, you know, like what did that wolfing out give him? Did it give him like super strength for it? And that's what we were basically just alluding to, right? It's not yeah. like he turned into that husky, like. <laughs> <laughs> it's not like there was like scratches at the bottom of the door. Yeah. Because <laughs> what the hell's a dog going to do in that situation? <laughs> I, he just needs a treat and a bed. That's right. That's right. Um, I yeah, loved seeing uh, the morgue. I mean, I remember yeah. all that stuff so well. Totally. That guy, I, Eddie, what a great oh, performance. He was so good. He so was good. so good. And I love, first of all, I love the, that he's like 
he's in the dead girl's body dancing. I know. Like, and then she flops on top of him and then he like, just like pushes her off as she falls on the floor. It's just, yeah. it's so off color. Which, it really is. Yeah. And it works. So we're like, she's there dancing. Like, and we're, and we're just like, and again, going back to the world building, it was like, we are, you know, Dyson's job was he, he did, you know, they, or my job at playing Dyson was just to take this all in stride. And that mm-hmm. this is, this is Eddie. He's, uh, yeah. yeah. And this is, this is just what Faye do when they're bored. Yeah. And I love that Dyson always like had a history with everyone. Like, Oh, come on, Eddie. Like we know yeah. you, you know, um, and Bo's just discovering all of this. Um, uh, but yeah, I loved seeing the morgue. Um, and I, and then I also loved seeing the, the restaurant stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. Because he did a lot in that restaurant. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then that great actor, Aaron, I can't remember his last name, but. Aaron Tager, who played Meyer or Mm -hmm. Mayor, depending on how you want to say it. He was in our pilot too. Episode eight. He was in our pilot. Was he? I go into to a Chinese restaurant to talk to, to Meyer. Um, he was in it. And then, then they brought him back to be in this episode. And I love it because this is when, uh, the storytelling, we really got into like each Faye power. And I just love that mm-hmm. he was, a, he fed on people's luck, you mm-hmm. know? Um, it was just so clever. Mm-hmm. And I Absolutely. love his little sort of, you know, entourage around him. And, uh, I loved that whole day. Cause I got to be with that actor, uh, who is no, he's no longer alive. Um, and he was an incredibly accomplished actor. And I was so lucky that I got to spend an entire day sitting across the table from him uh, filming. So he that. had so much yeah. charisma. So Story. Much. He had so proper charisma. He did. He absolutely yeah. did. Um, yeah. And I loved, uh, so I loved that whole sequence. I also loved um, all the guest stars. Like we talked about Eddie, the big mm-hmm. juice monkey guy who was like humongous. Yeah. Like I just I love was, people that look a certain way. Cause you're just like, wow, that's what you walk around looking like. You know, it's so interesting. He was, he was a, he was a wrestler, but I, th- I think he had done, um, saber tooth or something on, was it one of the X-Men or something? Like, I don't know. I remember like he had done something that was like, wow, that's really cool. Yeah. Um, but I, I can't, that's, uh, that's a very big recollection. This was a long time ago, peeps. <laughs> yeah, it was a long time ago. Um, I also, the other thing that struck me about this episode was watching how, like, I felt like Bo had like a little bit of arrogance in this episode, which I kind of liked. Um, mm-hmm. And she was kind of, she was pretty insensitive to Kenzie, you know, because in this yeah, episode, Kenzie's feeling episode. very yeah. sidelined. Yeah. So you, you started kind of, you and Kenzie started having, you start super strong and then it starts breaking down. You bring Dyson. This was an interesting episode in that a lot of sort of uh, relationship arcing and new paths got created within it. Mm -hmm. And like, considering that we were shooting completely out of sequence, that was an impressive job by the, the writing team of putting that together. And like, you know, kudos to us for like making it work too. But um, because you and Kenzie do a turn. Kenzie's really not into Dyson in the beginning. Kenzie and I make a turn towards the end. Mm-hmm. Like there was, there was a lot of setting new precedents, which opened up a window for uh Lauren, like Zoe's character. Like it, it, it's just sort of, it, it opened us up. Um, and, uh, you know, and, and, and then I think after this, like Kenzie and Dyson, they have those moments in like the foot soup episode. <laughs> Like, yes, the foot soup episode. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, you're right. I mean, we we saw a lot of um I, I don't know. I just liked starting to see friction between Bo and Kenzie. Um mm-hmm. and just and and Bo kind of not being um <coughs> excuse me. Bo not being uh, aware of it. Like I like that she could be insensitive. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. You know, as for, for as sensitive as she was to Mm -hmm. so many things, she could also be very insensitive and kind of arrogant. And I think Bo needed a little bit of that. Um, Uh, Yeah. She was just start. That was like, this is the first episode where she was like, wait a minute, I'm taking charge a bit right now. Yeah. 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 And in in our, in, in, in Dyson and and Bo's relationship as well. Like Dyson really was like, like, 
I remember we made jokes about what kind of Faye Red Bull is Dyson need. Like, does he need like Faye Viagra? Because, like, <laughs> yeah, there was a lot of skin in that episode. I, I was, was a little surprised. And I also looked at my body. I was like, damn. I was doing okay back then. (laughs) Well, you were. And you know what? It was nice to uh, have your body shown and not mine in that opening scene in the office, right? In the, in the, in the cop shop with their, with their, with Bo and Dyson setting the rules, which I like because, you know, that whole scene uh, was the, the very end, you know, when they decide to set these rules, you can see the hurt in Bo, Mm -hmm. you know? She doesn't really want these rules. And I don't think Dyson does either. I mean, maybe you think differently, but I think Dyson was, uh, they were both, they were both going to hurt each other. No, I don't think Dyson wanted them either, but Dyson was bound by the rules of the Fey culture. You know, that's, he, he was, he was, he was kind of at at this point, he was a company man, right? Mm -hmm. You know, he was, he was, he was a bit of a rogue, but he was also, he had his, you know, heart in, you know, the, there were there was boundaries for him. Yeah, and uh, I think this that was one of the fun things about playing Tyson. You know, with working with your bow the bow relationship was playing that dichotomy that that like inner struggle of yeah. he's not really free and like you're 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 working on your own freedom, but he's, you know, he's like a, you know, typical man kind of just stuck in it, stuck in it. And, uh, totally. But I think Bo was the first to kind of come in. Like, I mean, you know, Dyson is experienced at this point in his life Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and Bo comes in and she's not experienced, but I feel like that she's the first being that could ever get under his skin in that way. I don't know if everyone can hear my stomach growling. It's growling like crazy. And I don't know if you remember this, Chris, on set, how much my stomach used to growl. Sometimes. Yeah. There's like a blooper reel out there of my <laughs> stomach growling. It was painful, painfully embarrassing well, for me. You went some issues back then. Like, I oh, remember you trying to figure so it out. I feel, like, I feel like being on a show does not uh, lend itself to strong digestion. You're eating no. at weird times and doing weird things. But anyway. If anyone can hear my stomach growling, I apologize. Um, we can't but it's, you know what? It's par for the course. This is what it was like on set, folks. Uh, I loved also seeing um, the the whole gambling sequence. First oh, of all, yeah. I love Ksenia and I walking in, yeah. in slow-mo, right? That whole, oh, that shot. And it's so funny yeah. when you're filming slow-mo, you think you have to move slow-mo. Oh, <laughs> Right. Like you walk in, you're like, okay, sexy walk, sexy walk. And you're like, wait, I I'm actually walking slower than I need to. You don't have to do that. It's obviously shot with a certain lens speed or whatever. Um, and I just remember loving walking into that space, that space, it was full of smoke, right? Like all that kind of dry ice smoke machine yeah. stuff. And did you notice like every, almost every gambler around that table was a stunt performer? I totally did. Yeah. We all, this is one of the things I wanted to mention is like, it was so fun seeing. So we had the same stunt team for all the years and like how many different roles did those guys play? Like I remember Anthony, I was, and like he was one of the zombie guys in the zombie apocalypse yes. in like season four or whatever. And I'm yeah. seeing him there and like the big bald guy, I can't remember his name, but it was, it's great because, like, I mean, yeah, you know, we, us watching it, we're like, a uh, fight's about to break out, obviously. Obviously. You know? it's, it's not um, that whole sequence, I remember, was was kind of challenging to film, though, because, you know, the actor that played the guy with the thumbs, you know, the frozen thumbs. Yeah. yeah that yeah. whole sequence was just, I, 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 as you know, you meet someone 30 seconds before you film something like that. Mm. Um, and I don't know if you could tell when, when it was my double and when it was me, but whenever I had like a really ripped back in that sequence, that was, that was Jen. That was not me. Um, so if people rewatching, if you've just rewatched it and wa- I went, wow, wow, Anna's back is like really muscular. It's not actually. Um, that was Jen. And I just I noticed notice. in that sequence that there you see uh, my, you see us flipping, but that's because mm-hmm. I knew I was doubled. So this is a little behind the scenes for anyone watching. Um I remember you and Ksenia walking on to set in those dresses and I was yeah. just like, 
wow, what is that? like? I think those were the that was the biggest like brightest costume we'd had on the show up to that I point. Know. I, I know, I know, and wow. you know, first season we, we go undercover big. a lot. You know, we um we. I don't remember, know if you remember like how many episodes we actually go undercover. There's like episodes where you are going to be in like preppy clothes. We're like a, co- mm-hmm. a country club couple. You oh yeah, right. We later. have like, husband and wife and stuff like that. Yes. And, and like and we look, it's so weird to see like Bo in a blouse, yeah. you know? Um, but that's what was kind of special about first season. Yeah. Yeah. Um, sure. Yeah. But it was, it was like the brightest thing I think I've ever seen. Oh, did you also notice that in this episode, both of our stand-ins had roles. So when when I make out with my my high school sweetheart in the car, that was Matt, who for everyone listening was, was, I couldn't was tell. Chris's stand-in for the whole I series. I his face closely. I didn't yeah. realize I was Matt. So it was a bit weird to make out with Matt yeah. in the back of the car because I Matt I saw every day, all day, every yeah. moment of filming. He was Chris's stand-in and then um, he was other, you know, he – was other people's stand-ins too. And then Alyssa, who was my stand-in, mm-hmm. plays my mother in the flashback in the prison cell and then running through the woods. That was Alyssa. Oh God, it was so blurred out. I couldn't tell who that was. It was so blurred out. But you know what? She had to do this thing in a cell where she was like crying and mm-hmm. she brought it. I remember the whole crew was just like, <gasps> like people were moved by her performance. Mm-hmm. Um, but it was so cool. And for anyone listening, a stand-in uh, are – are people who are often actors themselves uh, or have done some acting usually. And they are there uh, after we block a scene and figure out how things are going to move. They come in and they stand in the positions that we are in so that they can be lit um, Mm -hmm. so that Chris and I can go off and get changed and get ready and whatever it's going to happen. But that's what they do. And they, it's a real skill um, Mm -hmm. to do because you've got to really match movements and, match kind of the body language of the people you're standing in for. And they were great. Oh, they were awesome. They were with us the whole way through. They were with us the whole way through. And they were just, yeah, they were just like good energy. But yeah, they both have roles in that episode, which I thought was kind of funny. Um, What was the most challenging thing about filming this episode? Um, Three of the scenes really stood out. I remember us both. I think the most challenging moment for both of us was that sex scene where we had to heal you from the, when you were frozen. Oh, oh yes. Remember? Yeah. I remember you and I were both kind of like, whatever, wherever we were in the shooting, it was like, we were both kind of feeling like, is this what this show, like, we were getting a little touchy about how much are we doing this? Cause we'd already done the office sex. And I think this was, this was our, I mean, this was a very sex driven episode. This is where Dyson and Bo, Bo and Dyson were, you know, figuring out their boundaries of like yeah. what they could do. So, I mean, we're banging all the time. <laughs> so all like the time. four times, five times in this episode. So I remember when this one came, both you and I were both like, Oh God. Okay. How are we going to do this one now? You're like frozen. I, know, and I like, had like, I had like an ice mustache. You had ice mustache. <laughs> yeah. and like, I'm just like, okay, let's get it done. Come on. Take what you need. <laughs> <laughs> you and, know, there was kind of a desperation in it though, too. Like it, 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 it served a function in, in that one. They weren't just, absolutely. they weren't just banging. They, it served a function, but I remember like having to play like deeply freezing um, yeah. and not, it actually looked good. I, my memory of, his, you know, I of was it was like. Too, I remember both of us were quite, you know, we were a little uncomfortable or like yeah. just tired. You know, we were just like, I remember that was the scene where we were both like, okay, whatever. We have to do this. Yeah. Um, but like, I think it won at work, but also uh, Ksenia or Kenzie's line out there when she's like, uh, I can't remember what agency she says, but you, you're like, you're like the Red Cross or something. It's like, you could cure cancer with that shit. With your <laughs> Yeah. Uh, and like with the banging on the wall with her and Hale out and Hale. there and like, and then Trick walks in and, yes. and the, the wind. And he's the mad. Window. And he's pissed, right? Yeah. And like, and then the uh, uh, picture frame fell, which I don't think was planned. I don't <laughs> like, think it was planned either. Lizzie's reaction was perfect. It was just like. <laughs> yeah. And, <laughs> like and it, it for everyone out. that watched, like all the sex sounds were done in ADR, right? Yeah. Like we, so which means as many of you know, at this point, when you go in and record your voice after, which is always so weird to do love scenes 
Yeah. You're kissing your own hand just so you know, and then you're like kind of making lots of sex noises, but that those noises were like loud, right? Like they had to be like extra kind of porn star. Yeah. Um, yeah. which, you know, is always a bit weird to do in a booth with, with John, the with nice John, the lovely amazing man John who, yeah. Oh, um, who so lucky to have we have to talk about still because he's so amazing. Um, let's see. Uh, what worked, what didn't work in this episode? That's an interesting one. I felt that this one worked quite well. Um, in my brief, you know, just rewatching it. Uh, it's interesting what worked, what didn't work. I mean, I think we've talked a lot about so many things that have worked. I, I can't think of things that didn't really work. I mean, I loved, yeah. it was a very, um, John Fawcett was a very visual director too. So like, you know, the morgue, the bodies all sitting up back to back, like all that kind of stuff. It was great. It was great. It, you know? it, yeah. There was so much that worked just in watching it. It was so enjoyable to watch, yeah. you know? And the warmth of the Chinese restaurant, like the, 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 the textural the colored tone, yeah. like going from the morgue, like blues and whites and like jaundice yellows to like the, the red, you know, that Chinese brilliant, like ox bloody red colors. And to those kind of, you know, those, uh, Aaron. And I think the young man playing, um, um, Seymour was his name was Dax, I think. Um, who, you know, they had that kind of big yeah, New yes, Yorker. Pride. I loved him, he was so yeah, well cast, he, you know, just kind of big. And, um, yeah, there was, I don't know, this, this, this was uh, one of my favorite episodes, I think. Um, yeah. just in terms of it, it just had a lot of a lot of body, you know, it, just, it felt. It, it, it felt like we're there was lost a lot, there was a, it was a lot of story to tell, and there were so it many was. characters. Like, like yeah. oh, the, go see Eddie; he's the morgue guy. Oh, and then there's the other body jumper dude, and then there's the yeah. um, oh, the the rhyme thrush or whatever his name was, <laughs> the guy yeah, with the thumbs. Right. There was that guy. You got to go see that guy. He's an art dealer. Like there was so so an introduction of so many characters. Yeah. Uh, in this one, there was a lot of ground to cover. Um. I remember, you know, with Dax who played Seymour, he, uh, he just had so much presence, you know, mm -hmm. like he, he had so he was really tall and mm -hmm. the scene yeah. where Bo goes outside and they, they kidnap her off the street. Mm -hmm. I'm walking along. It was so cold out that I, I swear we were freezing. Like our bodies were like freezing, like frozen solid. Um, and I'm supposed to knee him in the crotch where he, and he was wearing a cup and we've rehearsed it with the stunt team. Cause that is a stunt, believe it or not to knee someone in the crotch. Mm -hmm. And we go to do the take and I'm like, I'm just going to, you know, get him. Well, I, and you know, of course pretend to get him, but I, I, we kneecapped each other. Basically he lifted his leg at the same time. And we basically, you know, when you slam kneecaps with someone, mm -hmm. how much that hurts. That's what, that was our first take. And so <laughs> both of us are going, I'm like, I'm, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. And he's like, I don't know. It's, it's okay. Cause like, this is his first day on filming, but luckily yeah. it was so cold out that our knees basically froze and then right. we just didn't feel the pain. But oh, yeah, the God. first, that we basically, I just, I whacked him hard by mistake yeah. because you know what? I'm not a stunt person. And frankly, actors can't be trusted really <laughs> when it comes down to it. Uh, I was very careful with people generally, but I really did. Yeah, hurt yeah, that. I remember you were, you're very fastidious about how you approached your son. Yeah. I also, what, uh, another thing that worked so well, I thought was Cassie, the character of Cassie with the lollipop. Oh, right. Vanessa Maya, Maya. Matsui, I think is her name. Yeah. yeah. Uh, it was so fun to see her because like we've worked together on, you know, in the past a little bit, but she's also directing now and she's, yeah. uh, she's doing terrific. She was and making movies back then. And this was at a time when people didn't really, I feel like young actors weren't particularly encouraged at that time to make their own work. Like mm -hmm. it's really encouraged now, I think, because you can put it on Instagram. We could, we could make a movie right now and edit it and put it on Instagram if we wanted to, you know? Um, but that was a time when young actors, particularly women, weren't encouraged as much to do stuff. And she was like, oh, I'm making this short film. And I'm like, what? You're making your own short film? Like, what does this mean? Um, 
it's actually a little bit of a regret I have in the business was not recognizing uh, even before social media and that that as a creative outlet, uh, not sort of taking the reins in my own creative life. Not necessarily because I would have have a body of movies I've made that have you know released mm-hmm. somewhere, but just as a creative person, I wish that I had taken charge of that creative energy in a different way because I feel like, I don't know if you felt like this because we, you know, we were younger then and started when we were even younger. Um, but I, I feel like it wasn't as encouraged. We were more encouraged to become whatever they need you to be, Mm -hmm. uh, rather than take charge and show them what you got. Yeah, there was, you know, there's always obstacles, right? I remember we we cut together um, a reality TV show. I did, you know, we filmed three episodes and I remember taking it to some producers and they were really negative about it. And then like three years later, this exact same concept, which was basically a cooking show slash dinner party where everybody's cooking and eating together, we're all coming out. And I was like... Right. Fuckers, and I and I, I I let them crush my yeah. It's all you know, but that that's I, I think ever that that happens all the time. It and happens all the time, and I think it's easy to look back now. I and yeah. and sort of, but anyway. But Vanessa, back to Vanessa, she was doing Vanessa those things, and she was so incredible it. in this episode. And I love it was great. Yeah. Like both readings she does for Bo, um, because yeah. that's tough. What she does there, that's a that's a hard thing to act. Yeah. Like yeah. And and also like, remember on the day there was like the filming of it is one thing. And then they were flashing to Bo in the back of the car with, oh my God, what was his name? My, what was the boy that I murdered? And then Kyle. I, Kyle, that's right. Kyle, I killed Kyle. I mean, that's, that's not good. Um, Kyle's been wanting you since you were 17 years old. I know. I've been running ever since and I had forgotten his name. Look at that. Uh, Bo, Bo, Bo certainly didn't forget Kyle's name. But anyway, but so, you know, they're flashing back to that. But on the day of filming, that's not happening. That's There's no flashback happening before our eyes. So we're just kind of in that mm-hmm. moment. And it was just really um, powerful. I remember it was powerful. And when I watched the last scene with her, the, where she mm-hmm. reads about her mother, my heart, me, Anna, watching, like, when I watched this episode, my heart started racing. And I was like, oh, my gosh. And it's because I remembered that on the day my heart was racing because it was such a big thing that was about to be revealed, you know, that my mother is still alive. And so mm-hmm. I thought that was such a powerful ending um, mm-hmm. and so important in the series at this point for, for I mean, Dyson and Trick no more than they ever tell Bo at this point, but Bo doesn't. And this was a bit of a reveal. And I love that it was like a lollipop eating pig tailed, you know? Mm, yeah. yeah, it was, it was, it was a really fun character. It was yeah. really fun. Um, yeah. Any behind the scenes memories or secrets? Hmm. Well, behind the scenes, I, you know, it's just like, you and I in our, in our umpteenth sex scenes, <laughs> like that was, you know, just learning how to navigate that. And like, as two professionals and like, how do we do this and make it look good and yeah. make it and keep it fresh for each other. And, you know, but um, also it was the nature of the succubus. So, yeah. so that became a, an important thing to figure out. Totally. Right? totally. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Behind the scenes, I just, I, I mean, I, it was when you guys showed up in those dresses at the, at the party, I, I wasn't even in that scene, but I just saw you, I would like finished the scene or I was some, for some reason I was on yeah, why set. Why were you there? I were don't you, know. Were you in the. I think I just finished a scene or you know how. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Uh, I just remember seeing the two of you and like, <laughs> it was just like, Wow. <laughs> 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 well, yeah. good. I mean, because we were supposed to look wow, yeah. right? We were supposed yeah, to walk was, in. You know, just then you had that wig on, and yeah. like, I just remember you guys were just. I was like, wow, this is this is the team. Yeah, there you go. This is the team. Yeah, yeah. And, I can't think of any behind the scenes secrets, or I mean, I feel like I feel like we've kind of covered it. And yeah, I feel like this this. I guess the important sort of takeaway from this episode at this point in the series is that Bo is starting to become aware of the rules. 
and how she can mm-hmm. use them to her own advantage. Mm-hmm. You mm-hmm. know, she's still unaligned um, and remains unaligned, but uh, but she is starting to respect those rules. And I think part of that is is you know Dyson because he is a company man. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I, I feel like that was a really, the, you just see her, see that. And I, I just noticed that in terms of the storytelling and it was just a fun episode. We had fun doing it. I, that's, that's my memory of it too. And there's a lot of artistic validity in fun, you know, well there said. really is. There really is. There's a lot of artistry in this episode. The, 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 um, yeah. set design, Ian, Ian Brock, like fucking Amazing. knocked it out of the park. Always. And uh, always, always an absolute yeah. genius. And, uh, you know, John at the helm, we couldn't go wrong with him. He just knew the show. Yeah. And uh, yeah, this, 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 to watch it again, this was, this was a sweet spot. I remember this was like, I mm-hmm. brought back. Good John was a creative. Uh, I mean, he went on to do several amazing things as we know, um, and had done amazing things before Lost Girl. But you know how there's people that see the world like straight on, and then there's people that see the world like a tiny bit askew. Mm -hmm. And I feel like John is one of those people that has this lens, this askew lens on the world. And that's what just, he he was fun to be around. Um, and just creatively rewarding to be around. uh, Lost Girl again, wouldn't have been the same without John Fawcett. Not at all. John was, Um, John, in my opinion, was the, well, in combination with uh, David Green, they were, they were the visual creators of Lost Girl World and, and Ian Brock, those, those three. Yeah. Yeah. And they established that in our pilot and carried it through, you know, um, Mm -hmm. which was really cool to see. And this was so Mm -hmm. nice, Chris, to do this with you again. Honestly, thank you. Thank you to everybody listening. Uh, it means so yes, much that you, you are showing up with us every week to listen to the Lost Girl Rewatch podcast because, damn it, it was time for a rewatch. Um, mm-hmm. Bringing the family back together. And for me, I am the luckiest one because I get to sit every week with another cast member uh, that I love and cherish, just like I love and Please cherish you. Experience. Yeah. You too. And thank you. Yeah, you thank better you. have a good uh, box of Kleenex beside you there because uh, it's going to be an emotional ride. I want you guys to see if you're watching us on YouTube. Look, I mean, there are some gone. Look, this is this is uh-huh. what I've gone through so far. Um, but yeah, I do yeah. need some Kleenex. I really do because um, it's just a, a really special thing to do. It, it, we, it's far enough away that we can look back now and and hold our hearts and just feel very full. So thank Absolutely. you very much. Chris Holden Reed, and I cannot wait to see you in person. And I cannot wait to see you guys all next week for another episode of the Lost Girl Rewatch podcast. Bye. Hello, everybody. Welcome to today's spotlight. Let me just tell you if you were to meet our spotlight today within 30 seconds, you would know a few things about him. He is unbelievably kind. He is at the top of his professional game. He is a devoted husband, father, and friend. And his favorite movie is The Big Lebowski. Let's just stay in the real world. I mean, he has a dog (laughs) named Dude. (laughs) So uh, he became a dear friend of mine uh, as I spent countless hours in a sound booth perfecting Bo's dialogue. And he was always fiercely protective of performance and of me. Oh my gosh, getting emotional again. Please welcome the wonderful John Lang. Wow. Thank you very much. (laughs) Thank you, John. I'm so happy to see you. I'm really, uh, you have an age today. I'm jealous (laughs) as always. Just big giant glasses now to see. Yeah, they work well for you. So (laughs) it just frames frames your eyes. They're very beautiful. my eyes. Thank yeah. you, John. Um, we're so excited to have you here. As you know, this is a podcast for the fans of Lost Girl. Um, and we've been chatting about so many different aspects of the show. Uh, you were so pivotal in what people got to see in the final final product of yeah. the show. And we so I have a few questions for you. 
Yeah, I'm okay. Uh, I'm. You're ready. I'm ready. Okay. So, John, can you mm-hmm. please explain to Lost Girl fans what it is you do? Well, the term is called ADR. Uh, some people call it automated dialogue replacement. Some people call it additional dialogue recording. Uh, that's just the term of it. But what it is is what we do is, uh, you know, I would c- go through the entire, all the recordings for the episode uh, for technical reasons, and I would find any issues that we had. Um, sometimes it's the bad lav mic rubbing or something like that, or bad location sound. Sometimes uh, we're recording uh, ad lines or things like that. There's a lot of those for, you know, um, for various reasons. And um, sometimes it's all based on performance or accents or things like that, to, you know, to try to smooth things out. Uh, that being said, um, it's a very difficult process because um, do you want me to continue with or? Yes, please. Sorry. Okay. So, um, that process is like for me, uh, you know, Anna's shot maybe six, seven, eight episodes of the show before the first episode gets me f- to me to work on. Right. So I don't really know Anna yet at all. And we have to, I have to sit in a room with her the first time, critique her work, tell her what she's doing well and what she isn't. She has, she, we've never had a, you know, a relationship to, for me to even say these things really to her. But I have to. That's my job. So we go through uh, line by line. Uh, most of it was technical, of course. Um, actually, I don't think we ever dealt anything with performance. Definitely technical and definitely ad lines. And yes. ad lines are the trickiest ones at all because um, a, 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 an actor like Anna, you know, she shapes her performance. Every line has, has a, a shape to it. And then all the lines together for the scene create the dynamics of the character. And if we all of a sudden just chop in the middle of what she's always been saying on script, and now we're dropping in new lines to get the flow from her original performance to standing. And I, I mean, there's so many times I remember you guys, I was looking at footage, you guys, with the cold breath coming out while you guys are standing in like literally no freezing. clothes yeah, and, yeah. and freezing. And then, we have to drop in ad lines that have to fit the tightness of your voice and those types of things. So that's what I do is I work with the actors to get them back to where they were to make sure they're happy with their performance. And sometimes the ad lines aren't really that well written. So we'll, we'll always record them, but then we'll work on different versions and things to abbreviate and things, not make it so technically correct, but more flowing with the dialogue and things like that. And those are the always ones I always present first. Uh, when we're finally mixing the film. And sometimes I, w- I wouldn't even tell them that we changed the line until someone asks just right. because. I, I remember doing that with you, John. And that's what, yeah. I mean, that's what made me always feel so safe and protected by you because it, you know, the performance mattered and you're right. We had to yeah. kind of learn, we had to get to know each other. And, and, um, and I had a learning curve of figuring out how to even do ADR, which we've explained to fans over various episodes that it's sort of matching your, your voice. And, but it's more than just matching your mouth. And you taught me that. Yeah. So, I mean, yeah, I mean, uh, we came up with a system. Every actor is a little different. Oh, and part of my, a big part of my job actually is therapy for actors. (laughs) Because they're going to because they're going to come back and relive all those scenes and all those things that they've done. And, and, you know, it's difficult, right? I mean, it's it's not all glamour at all. When you're shooting, it's you guys are it, it it's a, a long days, crazy time. Sometimes you don't even know what the storyline is at this point because things have been changed. But you're doing these scenes. I'm just talking in general of shows, yeah. but uh, and actors uh, often come to you exhausted, right? Because they're coming oh, yeah. in before well, they, all they start their ADR. day. <laughs> Everybody hates ADR. They have, I, I can't tell you. I, and I'm talking like. Actors from from the biggest films to the they'll walk into the room and say, "I hate ADR. I don't like doing ADR." And my goal is, by the time they leave that room, is to go, "I like ADR, and I can make it work for me yeah. in the future, not well, for yeah. everybody else." So that's and that's, that's exactly what what you did, John. I mean, you made oh, it because I thanks. spent many hours with you. Oh, countless. Um, I mean, countless. sometimes you'd have hundreds of lines to do for technical yeah. reasons. And because and, yeah. uh, they you guys shoot in all, so many crazy locations, none of it's controlled. It's not like you're in a studio. Uh, even the yeah. studio created a lot of ADR in itself because it, it had a tin roof, if I remember correctly. So, uh, yeah, I, mean, I remember actually you coming to set 
Well, I was going to tell John that story. came to like listen. Yes. Yeah. Oh, please do because I was so going to ask you because, what, what some of your memories were. Because about I was Boston. shocked after hearing like the first episode or two, going, "Well, there's an issue here. Why am I hearing people opening pop cans and talking off camera while you have an intimate scene with somebody?" And I'm like very confused what's going on. So I called the producers and uh, the production manager and said, "I want to come to set. Don't tell anybody I'm coming to set." I want to come to set and just walk around for the day and just see what's going on. Cause I think we can cut out a lot of ADR issues uh, and save the original performance. Cause that's the key really is I would, I would be the happiest ADR supervisor in the world if I never had to do any ADR, right? Like right. if we could preserve all the original of everything, that's really hard to do. So I went to set and I remember you're sitting, there was a scene you're seeing, you knew I was coming though. Cause we talked. Uh, and um so it's like a bedroom scene. There's a wall, a fake wall. And then on the other side of the wall is a craft service table, like eight feet away from where you're shooting. And it was loaded with stuff and people. And I watch people open up a can of pop while you're in the middle of shooting a scene and people are talking. They're on their phones and things like that. So I had to give the bad report back to the producers and that. But that really helped in the future doing it. And I kind of got out of there without everybody knowing who I was either. So they didn't hate me later. So right, it's right. Kind of like I actually remember thing. you coming to set that day, and yeah. I just remember you kind of like had your hands on your hips, and you're just shaking your head, like, "Oh, what's going on?" I mean, there's so many things, stuff. so many things. I mean, they had doors open uh, yeah. right by the highway while you're trying to film, and it was just a lot of stuff like that. Yeah. But the, I understand in the course of the day, they're also, you know, I mean, while you're shooting this scene, they're preparing for the next scene, they're building the next set for the next episode. It's all in the same location, right? It's so all moving it's so quickly, so quickly. So yeah. I had to. Sometimes I explain to them that you have to slow down to speed up because you're just creating frustrated actors that have to come in and do lines of ADR that they should never have to do. Right. right. So, right. I mean, it's typical for all productions. I'm not saying this was just a nightmare of this show. It wasn't. They're all like that. Yeah. Yeah. What are some of your best memories of working on Lost Girl? Oh, wow. Um I have some, uh, well, some of my best, my, my fondest memory with every actor on that show is the last time I worked with them, uh, on the show. I know that sounds crazy. Yeah. yeah. Every single one. Cause that was it. You were done as an actor on the show when you were done with me. Cause you know, yeah. uh, we'd be, we'd be working on episodes 15, 20 weeks after you finished shooting but it wasn't over, but it was over at that moment. And I truly learned how much everybody loved their characters in that show. Cause you guys all had the biggest cries I've ever, ever dealt with on any production ever at the wow. time. So, I, I mean, it was, it was a very heart, heartfelt yeah. um, kind of thing um, for, for, I mean, different things for different people um, uh, for like Ksenia. I was really happy when she won the, uh, Gemini, I think it was called at the time. Yeah. She did. And I told a well, fond memory for me, the first time I met her after seeing her, her perform, I saw a couple episodes before we went in for ADR. And the first thing I said to her is, you're going to win a Gemini for your performance on the show. And she was like, ah, and she did. So, <laughs> uh, so I was really happy with that. Um, I mean, KC, just getting to know KC um, and then him sharing, because I have a son, uh, a son that does hip hop and another son's a drummer. I mean, all about that. Mm -hmm. But the advice and things that he would give for me to give my son, and then he would talk to my son directly and stuff that was, you know, it was like beyond work, right? It just, mm -hmm. it all became beyond work. Um, it, like therapy sessions for, for everybody, like I said. Um, and it was amazing because everybody would open up to me so much about so many different things in their lives at work you know, everything, the future, all those things while well, they and, all yeah, stood in front of a microphone, totally, which totally, made me which, feel the most trusted person in the world. Absolutely. And you were, I mean, you were, it, it's such a vulnerable space to be in, um, you know, looking at yourself on screen, but it well, was yeah. such a trusted space because of you, John. So everyone no, listening should know that. that not every ADR session goes like this. Um, no. John is, is, in particular, so warm and so kind and welcoming. And you really hold space for people that are in your yeah. presence, even just as a human, like outside of the booth, we have spent yeah. time together and, yeah. you know, it's, uh, 
It's well, one of my fondest memories of of the show. I, I, I don't treat when actors come in. I don't treat them as actors. I just treat them as human beings, right? Yeah. And, and um, it's funny, but they really appreciate it after some. And sometimes, like I've had a few actors that uh, I'm not going to drop names, but, but larger, but like big, big actors, big, big, big actors, mm-hmm. and after. Uh, well, the other thing too is I very rarely ever am working with a director. It's all left on me at that point, right? Not not even television shows, feature films, everything else that I do, right? Like it, it's it's kind of my specialty, and that's the ones that come to me for that help. Um, is that you know they've never been spoken in the sense that like, and I'll do a line with somebody and, uh, with an actor, the first line with an actor, and um, they will. You know, I'll say, well, you know, it was good. You kind of forced it a little bit. If you shape in, you know, uh, like do a half breath into the line. Don't fill your lungs up. You know, I mean, there's all these different things. And and, uh, think about this while you're sliding into the line that you have to do. And and the actor was like, oh, thanks for being so candid to me. Right. And I said, okay, I'll tell you what. I will just sit here and circle takes if you want. But I'm here. They've hired me to help. But if you don't want it, that's fine. I'm not going to, you know, yeah. within 10 minutes after that, every line. So would you think about that? Does yeah. it sit? You know what I mean? So yeah. it's just, they're not used to being, it's always like, oh, that's fantastic. Great job. You know, da, 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 da. And, and it sometimes isn't, and it just needs to be another take. Right. Yeah. And, it's that and I mean, honesty. it is, actors are very vulnerable, also deeply insecure. <laughs> right. I know that. Uh, right. yeah. And it's, that's the fact that you do know that. And treat yeah. it with such sensitivity is what yeah. makes you so lovely, but also what g- gives the end product that ends up being so so great to watch too. Oh, thanks. See, you're taken for granted, John Lang. I think <laughs> just how much you actually contribute to the final product, because, like you said, there's no director in the room with you. You're kind of left on your really? own. But I feel like people. I mean, maybe you're not really taken for granted. You people do well, know I the value that you bring. <laughs> <laughs> but part of it is, is that my work's supposed to go unnoticed. Yeah, it is. But right? it takes a lot of work to make that happen. Yeah. Right. If you, if you yeah. noticed your work, it wouldn't be particularly good work. Right. Right. No, if no. You, if yeah. you're like, Oh, exactly. What's that? Exactly. Or, you know, Oh, wow. That um, was an ad line. You know what I mean? That's, yeah, exactly. Yeah. That didn't work. What's that? Um, so yeah. yeah, it's not noticed. And it's, uh, that's the thing about skill is that you don't yeah. see it. You just feel it. And, and sometimes um, we just go in for those words. You say the whole line, but I'm just going to steal the one word to preserve the rest of it, right? Yeah. To always try to keep the original performance. So that's yeah. that's the fun stuff for me. Yeah, totally. Um, I have one final question for yes. you. If anyone listening out there is interested in getting into the field that you are in, how would you advise them to start? Um, okay, that's I'm, uh, everything's changed, right? Obviously, when I started, there was no school, right? I'm thirty. I started when I was nineteen. I'm fifty five now, so uh, thirty six years in the business. There's absolutely no school when I started. Uh, but the key is you got to learn from a school. You got to go to a school the, um, that focuses and don't do a broad general. If you want to be in post sound or a certain part of post sound, do a course for that. Don't go into a general because you're not going to learn anything in the general. You're just going to have a lot of general information and then you're going to start um, trying to find places to work. If uh, Internships, obviously, um, are the most important way. Uh, they, they suck for pay. I understand that. But experience is everything for sure. Um, and, but then find your niche. And, and the nice thing was, oh, let's change a little bit. Like ADR for me was, and I didn't realize when I, I just became naturally easier for me to deal with ADR for whatever reason. And I've, I've done all, I do all sound, but ADR um, is the FaceTime. You spend time with actors, you spend time with directors, you spend more time with producers. They get to know you. You become more wanted that way, right? Instead of just the guy in the back on a, in a pro tool system and traveling, right. ADR will open up the doors for traveling, um, to, to work with people all over the, all over the world. I, I, I've flown all over the world because I remember you flying here to LA. Yeah. I remember that's when you finally, she said, I finally feel like, um, not an actress, but what was the term you used? I can't remember. Like, there's weight to what you're doing because yeah. they flow somebody in. They flew right? someone in. Yeah. Well, they flew you in. Yeah. Yeah. No, but um, yeah. Awesome. Yeah. And I remember our last sessions, we weren't together. 
And that was heartbreaking for me, it if you remember correctly. It went well, but I met, you had your moment alone that day. I did. In that big room in, in Santa Monica. In Santa Monica with people I didn't yeah. really know. But yeah, um, yeah. yeah. it was a, a magical experience for me, John. We're, we're um, doing this podcast has been such a trip down memory lane and it's yeah. brought up so much emotion for me. Uh, right. Stuff I hadn't thought about in so long and- Thank you for being here with us today. Oh, we so flattered. appreciate it. Oh, yeah. please. We're so lucky. And the fans are so lucky because they don't get to see this side of it. You know, yeah. they've met Bo several times, um, but this is a way to share and explain all the people that contributed in such a meaningful way. You are yeah. one of those people. I love Thanks. and adore you. Cool. And I appreciate that. It's been too I long since I've seen you. Yes, I know. I know. I know. Well, I mean, we've just avoided, you know, COVID and all that stuff, but that's, yeah. we'll get back. We'll, we'll get back to LA. We'll get back um, uh, Cool. Awesome. Thank Can you I give out two shout outs? Yes. Can I give out two shout outs, please, yes. if you don't mind? Sorry. So, my son, Jack, the drummer, they just released a new EP from his uh, band, Black Budget. Okay. Um, it's called Crown of Misery. It's very hard music, but melodic and cool. Got great reviews. And my son, uh, Jeremy Lang, who's known as Clubber Lang, L-A-I-N-G, just uh, is releasing an EP as well. So just so you know, he's a hip hop artist. Thank awesome. you. Sorry. John has Andrew. very talented sons. <laughs> Thanks. And, uh, thank you for that. We will share that with everybody. Great. Appreciate thank that. Thank you, John. Okay. Thank you for listening to this week's episode of the Lost Girl Rewatch podcast, which is produced by Anna Silk, Rachel Scarston, and Seth Cooperman, with theme music by our very own Blood King, Rick Howland. Please rate, review, and share the Lost Girl Rewatch podcast. This enables us to grow and to continue bringing you exciting new content every week. If you don't already, follow us on Instagram and on our YouTube channel at Lost Girl Rewatch. You can also subscribe to Patreon for exclusive bonus episodes made just for you and get early access to all of our episodes. Okay, Chris Holden Reed, it is time to play... Would you rather? So oh I'm going to ask you a question and remember, keep this in mind. You have to spend the rest of your life like this. So would you rather spend the rest of your life with a wolf's body and your head or a wolf's head on your body? Wolf's head on my body. Why? The other way just looks stupid. This way, at least, you know, it's like, I could, I could still have, I could still have a career. <laughs> the other way, I'm just going to be euthanized and put into like some sort of experimental. But, you ha- but you'd have a wolf head, like right. a career. I mean, it's a very different career. At least the other way you could put a turtleneck on and still have Chris Holden Reed's face. But you're a wolf body. You could run really fast. That's Here, look, true. I'm challenging your answer. Your answer is totally valid. Um, yeah. And I love it. I love I love the idea of a, a wolf head. On I can still, head. like, it's still my brain in there. It's not like I'm a dog. I'm going to go around sniffing other dogs' butts, right? It's still it's still me, right? Well, but here's wait, the, this, the question is, Chris Holden Reed would actually run around sniffing butts. Let's stay in the real world. Like, let's just break <laughs> it down. <laughs> now, this is getting really funny. <laughs> yeah. The visuals um, on this are actually fucking priceless. <laughs>